Hey everyone, this is Daylon and Arun, host of the Stem Cell Podcast, and we're back with the last episode in our video series, rounding up the latest research presented at the 2020 ISSCR virtual meeting. We've had a great week at this meeting, but even though the sessions are over, we're not done yet. Starting June 30th, which is just in a few days, we're stacking this summer with a lineup of interviews with participants in this year's meeting. Starting straight away with our episode in a few days from now with Benoit Bruno, then it's on to Madeline Lancaster, Valentina Greco, Christy Redhorse, Martin Para, and Sergio Pasca. That takes us through the summer. You can find the schedule as well as previous episodes at www.stemcellpodcast.com. We've got some interesting research from the last day of the meeting that we want to highlight, also the penultimate day because we're in between. Um, but before we get to that, this meeting is overshadowed by the pandemic and pluripotent stem cells are playing a major part in the solution. As scientists helping scientists, Stem Cell Technologies has another something new for the toolkit. You can check out this upcoming product from Stem Cell Technologies. Generate fully differentiated and functional airway organoids with the Pneumocult Airway Organoid Kit. This medium is serum and BPE free and can be used to generate organoids from both healthy and disease samples. You can sign up now to be the first to know when it's available at www.stemcell.com slash ISSCR 2020-FTK. Arun, why don't you start us off telling us about the plenary uh, from yesterday evening? Plenary number four, dissecting organogenesis. This is a really fun one. This is actually probably one of my favorites from the entire um, ISCR 2020 is led off by Madeline Lancaster, who we're going to have on the show not too long from now. She actually recapped some of her recent work using choroid plexus organoids. We actually covered this on the podcast. Remember, I was talking about those little bubbles of cerebral spinal fluid that I just want to pop, right? <laughs> so she talked about that. It was a recent science paper, I believe. And she actually presented some really cool unpublished work on SARS-CoV-2 and how it can potentially infect the choroid plexus and not the neurons. And then moving on to another uh, researcher that we've actually talked about a little bit on the podcast in Mickey Ebisuya, where she was talking about um, recapitulating some of those cyclical oscillating patterns that determine the human uh, segmentation clock and also presented some unpublished work. I think it's on bioarchive now, how HES7, how the protein HES7 can actually drive the species specific differences mm -hmm. in the timing of the segmentation clocks. So really, really beautiful basic science. Unfortunately, because of some of the technical issues, she wasn't able to show the really awesome videos that we know that she has, but uh, you'll definitely have to check those out. And then we had Hans Snoke, who's also talking about SARS-CoV-2 a little bit, but in the context of lung organoids that are derived from human pluripotent stem cells, who's actually throwing a bunch of different viruses on, their, on the organoids, including SARS-CoV-2, but I was also looking at some of the long-term effects of, uh, of different diseases and how you can use these organoids to model things like, for example, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So really strong start to that session. Yeah, and I thought, you know, his parting words at the end of his talk, I don't know if it was the Q&A or just the end of his talk, that uh, his parting words were a little bit um, disconcerting for me because as much progress as he himself in the field has made, generally science has made on SARS, he kind of was still mystified. He said, "This we really don't know what's going on um, with this COVID thing. So a little bit scary. I guess we all got to lean in. Um and then there was April Kraft from Boston Children. She had a lot of really nice recipe stuff that I thought for making her talk title was knee in a dish uh, for making articulating joints. Um, and it was just, you know, I always appreciate talks like this that are in a field where there's not much work being done and there's not much focus. Uh, and she's kind of doing it all herself. So she had a lot of recipes. I don't think it's pu published. I couldn't find it online, but probably coming yeah. out pretty soon. Uh, and that leads me to uh, Todd McDevitt, who we also, I mean, we've had everybody on this podcast. I guess it is a stem cell meeting. But um, Todd McDevitt, who we had on the podcast, although then he was talking about hearts. Arun, you know this guy. He was talking about axial elongation in neural. What's going on there? 
Yeah, this is something I I really had no idea he was doing this. You know, I thought he was a heart guy through and through, but you know, he's focused on using these uh, stem cell derived organoids to mimic the neural tube formation. So, you know, props to Todd for kind of taking that shift. Although this is maybe something he's been working on for a while now. So, but that is, I believe, you know, some of that work is on BioArchive too. So, uh, that's uh, definitely want to check that out. Yeah, I respect uh, moving, the guy. I respect yeah. him for uh, broadening his horizons there. Sometimes you got to learn. Sorry to step on you there, but then we yeah. had uh, my man. Well, he's not my man, but I, I <laughs> admire him. Nori Saitu. I've followed his work for a long time, working in reproduction uh, in the reproductive space. He got the Momentum Award this year, I think much deserved for all his work uh, in pluripotent stem cells and understanding pathways that lead to germ cell development. Um, and then after that, it was the concurrence I can go through quickly. I had uh, four that I went to, of course, Christy Redhorse, who we're also going to have on the show. So I had to see what she had to say. It was really cool talking about tapping the potential of collaterals. Um, then there was Marta Zuzik, who was looking at photoreceptors. Uh, this was a postdoc in the Boostkamp lab in Germany. So it was nice to see some young talent talking about the work there. This was transcription factor screening using these reporters to identify factors that would induce photoreceptors. Um, and of course, the, they don't engraft. They look really good, but they don't engraft yet. Of course, the first uh, query from the audience was about engraftment. They're not there yet, but uh, they're on their way. Then there was Stephanie Luff, another uh, trainee who's in the Christopher Sturgeon lab uh, at uh, WashU St. Louis and was looking at retinoic acid and the relevance to hematopoietic stem cells. The only thing I can say about this, as impressive as it was, it was a bit of a letdown just because, you know, with uh, Georgia talking about uh, their work with the definitive hematopoietic stem cell, I feel like it would have been kinder to place Stephanie earlier uh, in the meeting so that um, she could get her plaudits for that amazing work there. And then finally, I went to the session with the Don Cleveland, who was really beaming about his work uh, with uh, astrocyte to neural conversion to treat uh, Parkinson's disease. And it was just fun to watch him because he was so psyched because the paper had just just come out like a couple of days before. And I don't, I mean, that's rare, right? You're at a meeting and you're like, oh yeah, the paper just came out. So he was beaming about that. And, and also not just his pride, but his level of uh, excitement um, about the possibility like this, you could tell he really believed that we're on the cusp of using this clinically. So it was, it was palpable. And uh, it really got me excited about something that normally I'm, I'm not really that excited about neural. So uh, <laughs> nice work there. Arun, what's your take on the, on the concurrence? What'd you hit? Yeah, um, a lot of good stuff to be excited about. You know, I also started off with Christy Redhorse. She's going to be joining us on the podcast not too long from now. Uh, Christy was actually a former thesis advisor of mine. So I had to stop by the talk and, you know, just to, you know, update myself on what she's doing. She's always done such beautiful imaging based work on coronary artery development. And she had a really nifty uh, project that she's working on looking at coronary artery collateralization and how certain species that live in hypoxic or, you know, maybe higher altitude environments have a more enhanced propensity to actually collateralize their coronary arteries. Mm. So we can't wait to talk to her about that. Next up, we talked where I went to Jeff Millman's talk on developing functional human islets for cell replacement therapy. He recapped his recent Nature Biotech paper that we actually also covered on the podcast and how the state of the cytoskeleton can actually correlate with differentiation fate. Went on to uh, Kristen Fried's talk using uh, single cell mapping of in vitro neurogenesis using mass cytometry, which is obviously a very powerful technology like Cytoff. It enables you to uh, profile a bunch of different markers on cells, and you're not limited to the the antibodies that you can use through fax. So I thought that was really neat to to see an application of Cytoff for in vitro and in vivo differentiation in, in the neural lineages. Aaron Slattery, who's actually using the Marmoset as a model for mammalian development, really neat work generating 3D transcriptomes. So you're able to add a 3D spatial component to transcriptomic analysis and even made some naive Marmoset embryonic stem cells. So that's not something you hear about every single day. And then finally, I wrap things up by going back to the cardiac session and listening to Suraj Kanan from Johns Hopkins, who is uh, evaluating something we talk about a lot on the show when it comes to iPS cardiomyocyte immaturity, but he was using entropy as kind of a readout for that. In particular, uh, he's developed a public tool that allows you to compare different cardiomyocyte differentiation protocols um, and the maturation states that they actually 
uh, in, induce in the different cardiomyocyte populations. So perhaps it could be a pretty useful tool for all of us doing IPS cardiomyocyte work. And then we moved on to plenary number five, stem cells and aging, started off by uh, Beth Stevens over at Boston Children's was using single cell to map microglia across development and actually was talking a lot about her IPS derived microglia like cells. And in particular for the, uh, for modeling Alzheimer's disease. And then after that, we had uh, Guanghui Lu, and I think you'll, you'll recap that one, right? Yeah. I mean, Guanghui Lu, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware how prolific uh, his group was, you know, he's from Shanghai and they focus on, the talk was programming and reprogramming aging. And I think he really just in covering the, the volume of his work, he, he showed how much, how deliberate their efforts are, you know, from using knockouts. They, they made like a progeria monkeys that they had the same knockout as progeria and analyzed the phenotype. They're doing that kind of across the board, looking for these molecules that provide this geroprotective effect. So they're working on, you know, eliminating aging. Apart from that, the session and it, it's probably me because for me it was very late at night and I was fatigued after um, watching Guangi as well I was totally demoralized about my scientific career and I felt like I was I was already ruined so I just went to sleep um, I did catch I woke up early and caught most of the rest of the session but I have to say it wasn't that exciting for me personally apart from I think the much deserved award the Tobias award that was given to Maggie uh, Goodell other than that I really don't have much to say about that plenary but again it was in the deep of night and I, it was very early for me before the plenary this morning i mean that's just just me i mean for you i don't know how you did it Arun. after that plenary and then what the plenary number six was at 5 a.m this morning for you so how do you manage that how did you get your eyes open well you know we're complaining but the reality is you know people in europe and the other side of the world are having to give presentations at three o'clock in the morning right so you know it's it's not too hard for me to get up at five o'clock if you take that into consideration but 5 a.m. West Coast time was plenary number six for me. This was reprogramming and regeneration started off by Botan Roska over there in Switzerland. He was talking about the human retina and how you can develop pretty advanced looking organoids to examine um, retinal function and uh, cellular function at the single cell resolution. Uh, these are really impressive, actually, very impressive multi-layer organoids that are pretty, that are more advanced than anything else that I've seen, right? One thing that uh, he did mention, though, was that there was variability when it comes to the actual organoids that you can get. And it's only some IPS lines that allow you to get these really advanced organoids with these multiple layers. So mm. that was a little puzzling for me to, to think about, but you know, it, it is true. There is definitely line to line variability in, in IPS cells. So this is one example of that, you know? Yeah. He really, the, the chat went crazy on that note, which is the variability, the variability. Um, and then in the Q and a, of course, the question came up and that was my favorite part. Cause he was, he was pretty much like, look, I'm a medical doctor and a mathematician, <laughs> <laughs> not a biologist. So you guys figure it out. So I thought right. that, um, I mean, this, I think he, he undersells himself there. Cause at this point where you're doing this kind of work, you're, I hate to break it to you, Boten, but you're a biologist now. Mm -hmm. Um, and not to, which is not to say the onus is on him alone to do all the work, but I think he should give himself more credit as this polymath. I mean, this guy does so many things. Uh, and when I went to look up this work to see if it was published, I found that he does, in fact, have a publication from June in Science uh, 2020. Um, but it's about gold nanorods or something. So he's like he's really all over the map. But the, the presentation was really, really quite beautiful and uh, definitely one of my favorites. Uh, moving on from that, we had Li Qian, who's a, a acolyte of uh, Deepak Srivastava, the, the current president. And she really uh, kind of expanded upon her journey that started in uh, Deepak's lab with these induced cardiomyocytes and, you know, the in vivo reprogramming and had a really nice display of her output and volume, the volume of work she's done, working out the details there and also talked a little about tar uh, targeting cardiac fibroblasts as a therapeutic target, which I thought was a novel point. Then there was uh, Tai Quan Tran, who was a uh, a uh, fellow at Merck. It's nice to see that Merck, these big industry places are still investing in the basic research, although clearly um, there's a vested interest here. This is Wint and Cancer, which is like right in Merck's uh, wheelhouse. So clearly they've got some kind of pharmacological angle there or a new pharma, new biologic, new stem cell therapy related. 
Who knows? But I'm skeptical that it's altruistic. I'm such a <laughs> cynic. Um, and then we had Shinna, you know, the opposite of a cynic. This this guy is really, you know, he's he's a god in stem cells, but he's also such a, a good man. And you know, I'll say it. I'll come out here and say it. The same thing that made Shinna so good at 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 what he did and does um, is what makes his presentation seem maybe so. Uh, vanilla compared to all these organoid beautiful pictures and crazy stuff that's going on in the rest of the meeting so you know a lot of people might have come out of that talk and been like huh but i gotta say that this is the work this is the hard work that we need to do and the and the crowd the crown it, it lies heavy on his head because he's got to actualize this stuff you know the japanese economy is very heavily invested in realizing the potential of ips sees and i think you know, he's taken a really strong role in that and is doing a great job bringing it forward. So kudos to you, Shin. I congratulate you uh, and uh, I hope for your further success. Yeah, it is definitely a point of national pride, you know, when it comes to IPSCs in Japan. But you really appreciate the attention to detail, like you said, um, that Dr. Yamanaka is really focusing on. And it is his duty and his effort, his focus to really bring these things to the clinic you talk about he talks a lot about uh, these master ips lines that are able to cover a large portion of the japanese population and he is laser focused on trying to make this a reality so props to him so the last couple of talks in that session were first one was from alta charo shifting a little bit into the policy and law side of things she was mm -hmm. talking about uh, international genome editing law this was actually the ann mclaren memorial lecture uh, international genome editing law and if it's actually even possible to have any sort of international regulations for this sort of work and one thing she actually mentioned um, in passing was the the idea of genome editing tourism that may be a reality in the future mm. sort of analogous to what we're seeing with stem cell uh, stem cell tourism too so that was uh, a unique non-science non-basic science uh, shift in the talks that it was really fun to listen to yeah, I, I I have to mention too and because there was one thing that I hadn't heard before I've heard it before but it forced me to ask a tough question in terms of this rescuing embryos she talked about rescuing embryos in the IVF space and for parents you know who run out of viable embryos from PGD and it's it, it's like a really tough question, I think, and forces this other ethical realm because we used to be thinking, oh, what's the right of the parents to reproduce versus like the risk to the child or the rights of the child, the future child. But now there's this whole other element of like, what's the, the duty to society that you're not going to introduce these variants that really don't exist in nature, these synthetic variants into the gene pool um that may you know jump up and smack you in the face like generations down the line so i yeah. thought that was a really really nice touch and i love that they have altachara in the society because she always brings little kernels like that that i think force the scientists to step back and ask the tough questions you know the moral questions the ethical questions that you know in, in the in the past year we've seen a lot of scientists have gone rogue and disregarded so thanks for that author you guys got to check that out that's it's yeah. a, a must must see yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you, you mentioned it, you know, scientists, a lot of times we just want to focus on the science, but especially in the work that we do in this field, when it comes to stem cell biology and genome editing, we can't just focus on the science. We have to view it in the context of the greater impact on society because that's a double-edged sword, right? It's like, yes, sometimes we want to be in our little silos as scientists, but the double-edged sword is our work is important, which is great. That's part of the reason that I actually got into this field because I want to have an impact on society, right? But you have to view it in the right light. And the last talk from that session was Fred Gage, who doesn't really need any introduction. He was receiving the ISSCR Achievement Award, uh, focusing on his longstanding work on DNA damage and repair in the neuronal lineage. And he, um, a couple of you know things, he's, he's covered a lot of different stuff in his talk, a lot of high profile published papers. One thing that he mentioned was that long genes are of course more vulnerable to double-stranded double stranded breaks, in particular in, in neural progenitor cells. But I thought that was a, a, an important consideration for especially those of us doing CRISPR. And with that, that's actually the last plenary that we are going to be covering, but that doesn't mean that your duty to attend ICR ends with us. That's certainly not the case because there are other sessions that you should definitely check out. And in fact, the one that's just about to happen, unfortunately, we can't you know, recap it in this 
particular uh, roundup is the COVID-19 special, the uh, COVID-19 special with Christine Mummery and the really one and only um, uh, pioneer when it comes to all things. Uh, oh, shoot, man. I blanked. Anthony Fauci, you're thinking? Anthony Fauci. Oh my (laughs) gosh. Wow. How did I blank on Anthony Fauci, the one and only, you know, probably the highest profile researcher, scientist when it comes to COVID-19 in the United States? Oh my gosh. Wow. I'm an idiot. It's early in the morning if you can't tell. All right. (laughs) Anthony Fauci, definitely listen to that talk. That's going to be a great panel. Oh man. All right. So that's the COVID-19 panel. And we also have another Uh, plenary coming up, plenary number seven, which is highlighting the translational potential of stem cell biology, uh, highlighted by St. Catherine Eason, who was formerly at the Broad Institute and is now at uh, uh, Verb Therapeutics, another biotech company. And uh, that's going to be pretty much the entire session. That's ICR 2020 in a nutshell, right? And uh, plenty of amazing talks to to think about. I think we were going to highlight two or three of them that we in particular loved. So why don't you start off with that? Well, before we get to that, I just want to say, you know, in terms of thematically, um, the it seems like the final plenary, it's like that's always the, the anchor. Whether they drop the final plenary or the first, it kind of shapes the theme of that. I think last year, maybe where it was more organoid and we saw the amazing ideas about um, recapitulating kind of developmental anatomy. I think now the focus is really on function, clinical translation, you know, as represented by that final plenary, all those immune engineering talks. I think that now we've really got our eye on the ball and and it doesn't look too far off. You know, a lot of these therapies seem right around the corner, culmination of, you know, over a decade of work now, the ISSCR is almost 20. Um, and stem cells have been around for, you know, 40 years and in human, they've been around for 20. So we're finally coming around to these, these long held hopes and dreams with stem cells. I have to say for my top three, if I had to pick three talks that I I wouldn't want to have missed. uh, And one thing on that note, the great thing about the virtual format is that you don't have to miss anything. I don't think I've ever gotten more information out of a meeting, Arun. Um, I don't know about you. You're pretty quick on your feet when you go in person. But my best three, top three, the three I wouldn't want to have missed is, of course, I have to start with George Escape. And this is like life changing for me. Uh, It's something that I tried to do myself and failed. I think I'm not alone. Hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of uh, researchers have dedicated years to this and and failed. So kudos to her. And... uh, The group, David Shah's group at Ohio State. Also, I really loved, although I think maybe there's some questions that left maybe some more questions and answers, um, the Botan Raska, because it was so beautiful. (laughs) His work was so beautiful. And I I loved the Q&A where he was pretty much just like, look, it's not my problem. I just do the work. I make the magic. Now you guys got to figure it out. So that was really cool. Check it out for the pictures and his personality. And last but not least, you know, Jun Wu, I I started my scientific career in training trying to make chimeras. And it was really at once validating to see that the the species bearer is real. And the reason I failed was not for a lack of effort or insight or, you know, technical skill. Um, But really, it's a real thing. And I I just want to compliment Jun Wu on the elegance of his experiments and and the way he's asking such uh, big questions using really simple tools. So that was really nice. And I wouldn't want to have missed that one either. Arun, what about your top three? Yeah, my top three were sort of in line with yours. One was actually a talk that I didn't know too much about. This was um, in the genome edited max, uh, genome edited um, uh, immunotherapy session. One of the, the things from the first day we were talking about, you know, genome edited macrophages, right? And how they're really effective at targeting solid tumors as opposed to uh, liquid tumors, a topic I didn't know much about, but it's something I want to definitely read into more now. Uh, Something else was actually more recent from Christy Redhorse, who we'll have in a couple of days, uh, talking about collateralization of the coronary arteries and how the, the species specific differences in coronary artery, artery development. The, the thing with Christie's work that always has amazed me is just, I've really never seen a scientist with that level of consistency when it comes to imaging, 
All right. She has a confocal that she has access to 24 seven in her lab and she makes the most of it, right? Absolutely beautiful images when it comes to the coronary artery vasculature. Um, so definitely stay tuned for, for that talk. And then finally, Sergey Pashka, uh, another talk that we've got coming up using this multi-organoid, right? This cortical spinal muscular assembloid that we've that they've managed to put together, whereby you can actually stimulate the cortex and it's going to generate a muscular response and a contraction that's super nifty, sort of sci-fi, which is probably why I'm a fan of it. Um, but those are just three of the dozens and dozens of amazing talks that you have a duty to check out. Remember, 30 days, still active for 30 days. So you can listen to these talks whenever you want. Yeah. And we'll have those guests on in the summer. So as well as others from the meeting. So I want to remind you to stay tuned to uh, the Stem Cell Podcast to get those. Um, but that brings us to the end of this 2020 ISSCR virtual meeting format that we're doing. Don't forget to check out our upcoming podcast episodes. You know, like I said, uh, follow us on Twitter at stemcellpodcast.com. We hope you all enjoy this year's ISSCR virtual meeting. You know, it had its hiccups, but I think there's a lot of elements that should carry through into the live format. We've talked about it in previous video episodes here. So I look forward to 2021, which is going to be in Hamburg, Germany. Arun and I will be there again. But you can catch us before then, in between, with your ears. Or look at last episodes. You know, there's five of these. So go back and check out from the beginning. Uh, thanks for joining us if you've been here for all five. Uh, we hope to uh, see you guys again soon. We'll tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs>